Um, and um, the left side you can see is California, so the west coast of North America. Um, I, I found these two images to be cool because it kind of created an island effect, but basically um, I'll be going over all the oceanic species that we saw on our trips out of both uh, California and North Carolina. So we'll get started with a little about me. Um, so I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, um, and I'm currently still living here for the time being. Um, I started seriously birding at age 11, um, but have had an interest in birds since I was uh, as little as a toddler. Um, I remember when I went over to my grandparents' place um, in Indianapolis, I, they had this uh, Sibley Guide to North America, which is this big kind of North American field guide um, to birds, and it has lots of colorful plates of all the species in North America, and I just was drawn to that um, since, since I was a kid. So I, I became obsessed with birds and just their colors and um, patterns, and I made it my mission um, from age 11 and on just to uh, study them and figure out um, how many I could see. So um, from there, I um, lived in Indiana and I couldn't drive. I was um, only 14 years old. So I teamed up with a lot of my uh, birding friends and big birders in Indiana um, to get 300 species in one year um, and a mini Indiana big year um, which was really fun in 2014. Um, that was a heck of a feat. I guess I didn't realize at the time that no other uh, birder my age had attempted to do that. So that was kind of cool to find out um, that I was the youngest person to do that. Um, and of course, I am studying uh, wildlife biology at Purdue University, which is a university about an hour north of um, Indiana. So. Um, just a little background on things I've worked on. Um, I've worked for the university that I am currently at doing uh, breeding bird surveys. So I uh, worked in Southern Indiana studying uh, worm-eating warblers and um, studying uh, Kentucky warblers and cerulean warblers primarily, um, just kind of figuring out their nesting habits um, and seeing how many um, were in particular areas of Southern Indiana. Um, so that was really fun. Um, added a couple species to the, the survey, like ruffed grouse and black-billed cuckoo, which was really neat um, to be able to do. And then um, I've had a little bit of kind of ringing experience or banding experience. Um, I've helped with seaside sparrow and painted bunting banding in Kiwa Island, South Carolina, um, which was kind of my childhood vacation spot. Um, that was really awesome. Um, and here's a picture of me holding a sawwet owl um, from our uh, Purdue uh, lab that bans northern sawwet owls in uh, Lafayette, Indiana, so northern Indiana. Um, but that was really fun. Um, they are very small. They are the smallest owl in North America. And you can see kind of by my uh, hands there that it is a rather small owl. <laughs> but um, then after that, uh, I just got back from South Carolina, Kiwa again, and I uh, led birding tours, which is really great, um, showing lots of different people interested um, in birds, just lots of species on the island, and ended up finding three new species for the island, which I was going to do the presentation on that, but I decided not to because the species I found were pretty common in uh, Europe, so I figured it wouldn't be as entertaining as uh, species in you know the middle of the ocean and the Atlantic and the Pacific. So I opted out of that. But the three new species I found were Rosiette Tern, um, Great Cormorant, and Galacus gull. So kind of, you know, not the best, but pretty, pretty neat for South Carolina, pretty un unexpected. So that was that was a really fun um, summer for me. But going right into the presentation here. Um, I just kind of want to define what a pelagic is, and I'm sure many of you know what a pelagic is. I just figured it'd be helpful for anybody that doesn't know um, to define it. So pelagic means open sea um, 
and basically open ocean. Um, but in birding terms, it really is any birding trip that is assisted by boat on a vast open body of water, such as an ocean. Um, and I said, in some cases, the Great Lakes. So in North America, we have the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan, Lake Ontario, and a couple others. And they are um, massive, massive bodies of water. Um, so, and those bodies of water typically get things like um, long-tailed yeggers or skuas and uh, savins gulls and little gulls and kittiwakes and other somewhat pelagic species. So it, it is kind of a, um, it, you can apply pelagics to them because there are boats that go out looking for those species and they typically do get those species. Um, same with gray phalarope or a red phalarope for us um, and redneck phalaropes are pretty common out there. And I said, you know, most pelagic birding trips venture several miles off the coast. Um, and I'll explain here in a second. The first pelagic trip I took off the coast of North Carolina um, required that we went very far off the coast. I believe it was an hour and a half trip from the island. So Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, and it's usually about 30 to 45 miles off the mainland. So you were really in the middle of the ocean. Um, and it's just pretty incredible to see how species, common species chop off and just kind of trail off and then new species appear. So we'll go into that a little bit. Um, so my first birding trip was in 2016 um, and it was to Cape Hatteras, North Carolina. Um, this is a lighthouse from Cape Hatteras. I was joined by my birding friends, uh, Ryan Sanderson, Ryan Hamilton, Steve Naraki and my friend Nick. Um, and we basically had a target list of potential species that have been seen. So we had uh, Wilson storm petrel, band rump storm petrel, leeches storm petrel, black cat petrel, um, white tailed tropic bird, which um, we were really hoping um, we might be able to see, and Cory shearwater, Scopoli shearwater. Audubon shearwater, great shearwater, um, brown booby, phase petrel, and Tahiti petrel. So all these birds had actually been seen within, I believe, three months of um, our trip. So I was really, really holding a lot of hope to get some of those rare birds. Um, but yes, yeah, so that was our target list. And you can see, so um, the starting dot is Indiana. And it was about a 14 hour drive all the way to Cape Hatteras. Um, so it was, it was a, a long car ride, but um, roughly about 10 or maybe longer than that, maybe 12 hours into the car ride. Um, Nick, my friend, uh, looked at reports on eBird for North Carolina and saw a really interesting report of a brown booby. So, um, completely random, um, this brown booby, which is kind of like a gannet species, um, randomly got uh, stranded in this inland lake about, I would say, 50 to 60 miles from the coast of North Carolina. Um, and it was just reported, I think, I believe in early June um, when we had went and I, we had both not seen that report yet. So we were very excited and we told the driver, Ryan Sanderson, we, you know, like we need to go see this. We need to, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it's an hour, 45 minutes, like we definitely should go see this. And he agreed. So luckily he, um, you know, said, let's, let's go see it. And we got, got there and we, we got the bird. And this is an actual picture of the bird. Um, so as you can see, graffiti on this rock, it was this inland lake with this one cliff face that had a bunch of graffiti on it. And the lake really was, it was a very small lake surrounded by forest. So this bird was very lucky to even find any body of water um, to, to come down in. Um, and one of the craziest things that I remember seeing about this bird was its flight style. And so, as you can see here, um, you can see kind of hikers in that red soil in the background. It's just very foreign for the species. It's an open ocean uh, bird. Um, 
but they got these long, big wings that are kind of awkward in flight, very similar to gannets. Um, but they just seemed more kind of lazy than gannets in flight, um, which was really interesting to note. Um, but this individual uh, stuck around for a while. So these were two of um, my pictures. And then this was a picture that was taken a month after our trip. And this was taken in September. Someone had kayaked up to the rock and gotten ridiculous photos um, of the bird. Um, and then uh, in October, someone did the same thing, got more pretty good photos of the bird. But this was the last photo of this uh, charismatic bird um, before it, of course, I believe died, um, which was very unfortunate to, to hear about. But in a lot of cases for a lot of these pelagic species that get um, off track, they do likely um, eventually pass, um, which is a very unfortunate. But um, I just found it interesting to see the progression of the bird. You can see the wings are a little worn. Um, and clearly it's out of its element. So it would make sense that it eventually passed on, but um, I just wanted to show the last image of the bird that we got to see. So the day it ended, we both, you know, everybody was very happy to have gotten this um, wonderful lifer, a very unexpected bird on our, our trip there. And we had our pelagic to look forward to in the morning. So, Day two finally came and we were about to jump on the Stormy Petrel 2. So this was our Cape Hatteras Pelagic Boat Tour. So we um, were greeted by our captains um, at about 6 a.m. So very early um, for us, um, but really you have to get up early to see lots of birds. So it was pretty routine for all of us. Um, and we were greeted by our captains, Kate Sutherland and Brian Pattison, which are probably arguably some of North America's um, leading experts in Atlantic pelagic species. They have been doing this for, I believe, over 15 years. Um, they've helped written a lot of sea watching guides um, to North America um, and just uh, books on petrels and storm petrels. Of the Atlantic. So I was very excited to get to meet these um, specialists. Um, but as I said, we boarded the boat and we headed out to the Gulf Stream, um, about 35 miles off the coast of North Carolina. And this is a picture of our actual boat um, that we attended. So a decent sized fishing charter. So this I, I could not find the life of me and through my photos, um, a picture of us on the boat, but my friend Ryan um, had done this pelagic multiple times and this was a picture he took from years ago. Uh, but it, this basically was what it was. You can see the mainland in the background and that was us heading out um, to the, the ocean. It was kind of a, a tight boat, but um, we got to know a lot of the birders on there and it was a very enjoyable time. Um, so one thing I learned attending my first pelagic was that trolling and chumming was extremely, extremely important if we were intending to see lots of pelagic species. So um, as soon as we boarded the boat, um, Captain Pattison started cutting up bait fish, um, some mullet, on deck and stuck them in a, a metal cage that kind of hung off the boat um, and it kind of traced a bunch of oils in the water and left kind of an oil slick um, and um, you know he did that kind of immediately as soon as we got on the boat just to kind of prepare for it but um, up until about 10 miles which was about 30 or so minutes on the boat we were seeing pretty usual um, suspects for kind of just coastal um, species in the area. So royal and sandwich terns were joining us. Um, here's, here's a picture of the, the box that kind of had all those, that chum and uh, fish guts in and very tasty um, food for a lot of our pelagic species. Um, and he would just kind of hold it on a uh, metal line and just kind of tether it through the water and see what what would attract 
um, you know, see what will come to that slick. Um, but we had lots of laughing gulls that were interested in the slick initially. So they flew in and um, had those following the boat for a good, you know, two or three miles. And here's a picture of a, a sandwich churn that was um, following the boat for a good, again, you know, mile or so um, with a couple royal turns too. Um, but that, that, was, that was fun for a little bit, but I think everybody on the boat were, were ready to see other species. So finally, after about an hour and a half or so, um, almost two hours in the boat, we reached the Gulf Stream. And this picture illustrates pretty much perfectly the true division of the Gulf Stream to the, um, just the Atlantic. So you can see dark, the dark water was kind of the typical um, Atlantic water that we had been traveling in all that time. And the light water was the, uh, the Gulf Stream. And it was truly like clockwork. As soon as our boat passed over this line, we were um, starting to get birds. So our first most exciting bird of the day, of course, was a Wilson storm petrel. So we had flocks of these guys, literally a, maybe within five minutes of crossing um, the Gulf Stream, we had um, storm petrels uh, beginning to come to the slick flocks of them. We had, like I said, 70 birds by the end of the day. Um, and these guys are very charismatic. Um, and you can kind of see here um, in this range point map that they are very widespread um, storm petrel, if not the most widespread storm petrel in the world. Um, so that was kind of a real treat, um, but expected, um, which was always fun to see. Um, and then our um, next very exciting species was a great uh, shearwater. And these guys were kind of difficult to get great photos of because they would come in, they would land for about two or three seconds, kind of chase off all the storm petrels, get some fish, and then they would book it. And then throughout the trip, um, we'd have multiple birds kind of trailing um, occasionally the, the slick. Um, but it was so funny because they kind of acted as if they were Jaegers almost um, to the storm petrels. They would push them off. They would chase each other off. They were very kind of rude, uh, but and also very vocal um, birds, which I was not expecting. But they were cawing a storm, which was quite interesting. Um, and they they did they came in groups, which was really neat to see um, just their flight pattern. Um, but very very cool species. Um, and here is another photo that my friend Ryan got of one um, from our trip. And you can see their range is quite interesting. So these guys nest in the South Atlantic um, and they migrate as far north as kind of um, Newfoundland area um, and as far south as the southern tip of South America. So they really are, um, they're just quite amazing birds if you think about their true distribution on the ocean. Um, of an Atlantic specialty, that's a good word to describe these guys. Um, and I couldn't help but notice their extremely interesting feature that all shearwaters have, but particularly prominent on this species uh, was their tube nose. So this was such an interesting um, thing. And this is again, my friend Ryan, who is a much nicer camera setup at the time than I did. Um, but he got some great shots of these birds and he allowed me to show them to you guys today. So this is this is one of the photos he got of the great shearwater. You can see these two nostrils that are poking out. And this is what gives way to the name tube nose. Um, and tube noses are quite fascinating in that they really rely on their nose for a lot more than just smelling food. Um, these guys actually use their sense of smell um, to identify where their nest is at a breeding colony, which is really interesting. Um, and great shearwaters are, uh, among other species that use this, um, are one of the most, um, I guess, prominent species that, that use this tactic and have been recorded to use this tactic. Um, 
in their breeding colonies, which I found really fascinating to get to see. So our next very exciting species of the day was band rump storm petrels. This was one of my favorite species to get to see. Um, and here's a really good kind of comparison photo. So the two birds in the, the center are band rumps. And you can kind of tell based on their, their uh, wing shape, they got these kind of larger, kind of more hunched back uh, wings with kind of more curvature to them. Um, and then in the, in the right hand corner here, you can get a Wilson's um, comparison. And they're just slightly bigger, I think by a couple inches. Um, and they usually came in in pairs. They would come in in like groups of two or three, and they would just come in very quickly to the slick. They'd take a bite from something in the slick, and then they would be gone behind a wave. And then in 15 minutes would go by, two more would come join the slick. But the Wilsons tend to just stay throughout, throughout the entire, entire day. So we had plenty of them, but it was really, really nice to get to see these guys. So this is uh, one of my friend Ryan's photos of the band rumped. Um, you can kind of get a better idea of that kind of more broad wings. Um, they just kind of have thicker wings um, and they are just a slightly larger bird, but their range is extremely restrictive, um, making them a really a, a big target for this trip. Um, as you can see, they basically, their non-breeding range is, in, in, at least in, in the Atlantic, is very restrictive. Um, and they breed, I believe, in areas in the South Pacific and South Atlantic. But um, they were thought to be very, very um, rare up until about 10 years ago um, that actually Brian Pattison, the captain of the boat, um, began recording them on an annual basis and this had never happened before. So um, this is a species that has actually started to show up in more regularity as recent as 10 years. Um, so it was truly neat just to get to see a species that, you know, 20 years ago would have been extremely rare to have seen. Um, and they actually extend as far north as the North Atlantic. Um, and I don't know um, the status of records of them off the coast of um, Britain. Um, I, I, I'm sure there might have been a few records given their uh, vagrancy patterns in the past. Um, this is a really interesting species too, because um, back in the 1800s, I believe it was 1880, um, there is a band drum storm petrol record for Indiana. Um, and Indiana, of course, is kind of right under Lake Michigan on the map. And there was a band rum storm petrel that got blown off from this horrible hurricane. Um, and it was so lost that the only thing it was hovering over was a wheelbarrow full of water. And two days later, at the time, this was the most acceptable way to collect and record birds. The bird was collected and shot and, um, of course, made into a specimen. So I've actually gotten to see the specimen, um, but just to think that where that bird started off and how it ended up in Indiana is just quite incredible um, to really think about. So that was really cool. But our next, our next species was another storm petrel, which was a single bird, um, and arguably one of the most exciting for me, um, a leech storm petrel. And leech storm petrels are really cool. They are very similar to band rumped, other than um, the fact that they have kind of longer tails and longer wings. So they are kind of longer winged and longer tailed. It's very slight. Um, in flight, they kind of are more shallow um, than the kind of broad winged um, band rumps. So this kind of immediately caught my eye um, when I saw that out there. Um, and it was only one individual. It came to the slick for less than five minutes and then it disappeared in the void of the ocean. So that was a real treat to get to see that. Um, and again, that's kind of a document photo. It's not the best photo, but um, this of course was my friend's photo of it. He had much better equipment than I did at the time. Um, it, he had much better zoom, but you can see leech storm petrels breed um, 
all the way in the North Pacific, um, all the way up to Alaska and parts of the North Atlantic. Um, and they migrate all throughout the uh, oceans, um, locally in the Atlantic, um, but there's not actually a ton of data in the Atlantic, but there's plenty of data for them in the Pacific where they're a little more common. Um, so that was, that was a real treat to get to see that. And th this photo kind of illustrates those longer wings and longer tail um, compared to the, the band rumps that we, that we just saw. But so three, three storm petrel species for this day, that was truly incredible. Um, and now for one of the most, um, incredible birds that I had ever seen, a uh, black cat petrel. So black cat petrels are fascinating birds. Um, they are, uh, so basically when we were on the boat, we were, um, had just gotten a great show of storm petrels and about 20 minutes or so go by. We're just continuing out in the Gulf Stream and Kate calls out black cat petrel. And my first reaction, of course, was to grab my camera but the bird had flown over the boat and it disappeared. And then in less than two minutes, two of them shot right in clear view. And I got this photo of, of one individual. And um, I just, it was such a quick, but a very lucky shot to have gotten this. Um, so that was, that was just incredible to get to see them. Um, and over the day, we actually had 12, which was, which was great. Um, so here's a picture of uh, another individual. You can kind of see they're, they got these funny pink and black calico feet um, that they, they kind of dove in the water, kind of like uh, almost like dolls going down for, for food. Um, and they would chase each other. Um, they chased a lot of the great shear waters, um, which was really fun to watch. Um, but they're very charismatic species. I, I found them very fascinating. Um, and um, to talk about them a little more. So just like the band drum storm petrel, they are another South Atlantic breeding species that does not have a ton of data on them because of how localized the population is. Um, so basically, they, their population is reduced as of 2021, current st static uh, statistics are 2,000 birds, um, excuse me, 5,000 birds. I um, mean, left in the world. So I got to see, um, you know, just a, a sliver of that population, which was truly um, amazing. Um, and they, they came in two different morphs. I, I only have pictures of one of the morphs, but um, they can have kind of this, either a white kind of cap. So where, where there's kind of a, a almost, I guess you would call it a, an ear or a pole right under the eye. That can be white in some cases, um, and the white can extend up. And it was thought to be that those were different subspecies at one point, but um, further research has suggested that it's just morse. Um, but it was just, it was a real treat to get to see these. Um, and the red dots too on this map show vagrants. So that kind of is where storms have pushed these birds inland. Um, but just to think about how uh, low of a population the species was and to get to see them was just amazing so that was truly incredible and we you know we're riding this high of lots of exciting birds when the best bird on the trip showed up out of nowhere um so i tell the story like this so i was paying attention of course to the petrels having lots of fun with them and I saw this white bird extremely high up, way, way up, kind of descend from the clouds. It was like very heavenly. And it was in the glimmer of the sun. And um, I really, I, I, it was so hard to keep looking at the sun because this bird just kept coming down right in the sun. And all of a sudden it came down so low that I, I was able to obviously know exactly immediately what it was. And it was a white-tailed tropic bird. Um, this was a species that they had actually only recorded one other time um, throughout the year um, that they've been doing those tours um, and they had, they go out I think twice a week so I mean that was a true treasure to get to see this bird um, and of course this is this is my photo with my 
you know, not so great equipment at the time. So you can kind of tell it was pretty close. Um, and I'm actually wearing a um, nice uh, Tropic Bridge shirt right now just to kind of show this, but it, it was a very incredible um, a burden. I, I will never forget that. Um, definitely the highlight of a trip for, for sure. So here are some of my friends' photos of it. Um, and really interesting um, about this bird. So certain populations of yellow blood tropic bird can be yellowish in pigment. Um, a lot of them typically are um, white, but um, the, I believe it's the South Indian Ocean that has the yellow um, subspecies. Um, but our Atlantic birds, our South Atlantic subspecies that we saw on this trip, they have, um, they can typically have anywhere from a white tail streamer or kind of a yellowish tail streamer. And this one had a yellowish tail streamer, which I found to be really, really neat to get to see. Um, and you can kind of see it better here is another picture, my friend um, of the bird. And it was just beautiful. It just stayed there for a good five minutes, just soaring uh, swiftly over the boat, came down to the slick once to get a fish, nailed it on the first try. And then within about 10 minutes, the bird drifted off. And the flight style of these birds is just so unique. Um, it's unlike any species I've ever seen. They, they're very um, light in flight. They, they don't kind of, it's not shallow winged each, it's very um, calculated and almost, I, I, I don't know how to describe it, but it was truly incredible. Um, so this range point map kind of shows where they breed. Um, they breed kind of a little bit in the uh, Caribbean here and they migrate all the way up to about, mm, I would say the coast of uh, Massachusetts, just about. Um, and then a separate population goes over to, like I said, the, the Indian Ocean, and that, that area, kind of New Zealand area. But um, this was the Atlantic populations range, which is just crazy to think that that bird, you know, could have nested some island, the South Pacific or South Atlantic and showed up right there on, on over our boat. So that was truly uh, an amazing experience that I will never, never forget. Um, so a little trip summary of our very successful Pelagic trip. I added 10 lifers um, this trip um, and two species not photographed. Um, they were just very quick looks, um, but Cory Shearwater and Audubon Shearwater were also seen on the trip. They came in so quickly. I, I, I just had time to get my binoculars on them and I got to see them. Um, and Corey's was identified by the captain. Um, so I felt confident and not uh, missing a Scopoli's potentially uh, based on that split. Um, but it was definitely Corey's after um, someone else got photos on, on the boat and was identified after, but Audubon's too, Audubon's shearwaters, very interesting species, kind of a small shearwater species that we got to see. And the craziest thing, I mean, this trip was already nuts, but the day after the pelagic, um, a juvenile crested caracara, which is a raptor, um, had been seen at Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, which was a first record for North Carolina um, and a life bird for me. So that, that was, an incredible shock, um, an incredible bird to get. Um, it had been present, I think maybe a couple days after we had gotten to see it and then it was gone. Um, so that was a real um, right place, right time experience. And that actually is the only Crested Caracara I have um, for my life. Um, and I've been to places where they are pretty common and I have yet to see one. So. Um, just to think that I saw one in the most unexpected place on an island in North Carolina, it's just pretty, pretty funny. So that, that was really neat. And um, you could see the Cape Hatteras lighthouse in the background there. So that was really awesome to get to see that. So moving right along into our California trip. Um, and this was in 2018. Um, so a couple of years had gone by after my North Carolina trip and I was eager to get back out there and see what, you know, the Pacific Ocean had to offer. So um, in 2018, 
my friend Ryan Sanderson, as I've talked about, um, and Ryan Hamilton, Mike and Sarah Maxwell, Nick Keel, and I all flew out. Um, luckily, we flew this time and didn't drive, um, so we avoided our 15-hour car ride. Um, we flew out to California from Indiana, um, and our, some of our targets uh, included Tufted Puffin, Black Storm Petrel, Ashy Storm Petrel, Fletch Footed Shearwater, which was rare but possible, Palmer and Yeager, Common Myr, Black Footed Albatross, um, Rhinoceros Oclet, Cassin's Oclet, Scripps Mirrorlet, Pink Footed Shearwater, Bowler Shearwater, Sooty Shearwater, and South Polar Skewa. So that, that was our initial list that we, if we could get even one of those, we would be satisfied, maybe a couple of them, but um, it, was, it was great. So, and this is a picture of Half Moon Bay. There's lots of rock structures, very rocky coast. Um, so you can see this is our route. So we went from Indianapolis all the way across the country to San Francisco, which is just uh, north of Half Moon Bay. Um, so that was, that was a great um, trek, um, but it was only a, like it says four hour and 15 minute uh, flight, which really was not that bad, um, especially compared to the, the driving that we had already endured in North Carolina. So that was an easy, easy choice. Um, and, but yeah, so moving right along, we slept the night after we got off the plane and uh, woke up the next morning and um, we arrived on the docks. We were assigned actually to arrive on the docks at 7 a.m. Pacific time. Um, and where we were greeted with one of the leading seabird experts of the Pacific Ocean, Debbie Shearwater. And that is actually her real name. She was a character in the big year movie. Um, it's, there's a scene, I believe, there's like a, a tr uh, Siberian storm and they take them out on a pelagic to see some potential Siberian pelagic species. And um, her character was depicted in that movie. So that it was just real, really cool, really surreal to get to experience this. Um, and her character in the movie was pretty gruff, but uh, she was pretty gruff in person too. So it made for a very fun kind of sarcastic time. Um, and uh, just like in North Carolina, um, Shumming uh, just kind of started right as soon as we got on the boat. Um, and this is her explaining to all the birders kind of the rules of the boat, um, what to expect and what not to do. And, you know, because um, in the Big Gear movie, there was, of course, uh, Sandy Camito's character was uh, played by Owen Wilson, who was getting on her nerves about, you know, her pointing out whales and whatnot but of course there was some people that were on the boat that were a little less than happy when she called out a sea lion or a, you know a, a other 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 things other than birds but um she basically said if you don't want to do that you can get off the boat and we obviously didn't care about that we love animals so we were happy to um be okay with her rules for the boat um, but for the first 10 miles out of 40 um, off the coast of California, um, chumming began and we had an oil slick very similar to the cage that was drawn up in North Carolina. Um, and we had just kind of the reversed coastal species following the boat. So we had Western gulls, Hearman's gulls, um, elegant and royal terns trolling the boat. So just kind of all sorts of um, turns and uh, gulls and California gulls as well kind of trailed the boat for the first 10 miles. Um, but unlike in North Carolina where the gulls kind of stayed for a long time up until you got to the, the shelf, um, pelagic species were almost in the first, I believe, like maybe 15 minutes on the boat, we had our first uh, sighting of a uh, pelagic species. So our first sighting was sooty shearwaters. Um, so here's a picture of mine of sooty shearwaters out there. Uh, just This is just a little flock. Um, and you can see some bigger shearwaters in there. Those are pink footed shearwaters. Um, but these two species were easily the most common. Um, and it, it was just incredible. So when we saw our first flock, they were all in flight and Debbie called out sooty flock 
and hard to miss. And she was a hundred percent right because it was as if, and they were several, they were probably half mile out in the ocean, but you could see this just wave of black, um, just kind of crossing over the waves, um, just kind of descending into the ocean. It was just incredible. They were all city shear waters, just hundreds of birds thick. Um, we probably, the eBird checklist estimated, I think, roughly 450 birds, but there could have been a lot more. Um, I, I would maybe argue could have been 600 birds thick. Um, it, it, it was just incredible. And you would think that there would be lots of different species mixing in these flocks, but it tended to be just either sooty shearwaters only, or like in this flock, a couple pink-footed, which um, we'll get into a little bit later, but um, that was just incredible. So here's another picture of mine now with my new setup, my new camera setup. Um, so photos are a little better this time around. Um, of a, a study that came very close to the boat. Um, very curious birds. So these also are pretty vocal birds and I, I didn't realize that. So when they're in a flock, they'll make these kind of buzzy calls, almost like kind of low murmuring calls to each other, almost whistle-like calls. Um, and you can only really hear it if, if they're pretty close. But um, when a flock came by, like this individual, it, it just it would murmur and then it would dive down to the water and catch something and then come back up and then keep trying again. And um, yeah, it was just, it was truly awesome to see these guys. Um, and you can see why they're called sooty shearwaters for how dark they are. But these guys basically are found um, throughout uh, the Pacific and Atlantic. Um, they are way more widespread in the Pacific. Um, they nest all the way down in New Zealand and um, some islands in the South Pacific and migrate as far north as um, the Illusion Chain. So it's pretty, pretty incredible, um, just the, the amount of miles these birds travel after they, they successfully breed, especially this population, the Pacific population. So our second um, latest species of the day was pink-footed shearwater. And these guys were larger than the, the sooties. Um, and as I said, second most common shearwater species on the open ocean. Um, they were large and again, also sort of vocal, but a little more quiet. Um, and they were, despite having 125 birds throughout the day, they were very frustrating to photograph because they would either be way far out in a city uh, shearwater flock or one individual would come by and it would barely, it, it would never put down and it would just continue just kind of soaring along right, right above the wave and then coming up and then panning and then coming down and then coming up and panning. And I believe that a uh, flight style is called shear watering. So it was very appropriate, um, but, but yeah. So here's another photo of um, the pink footed kind of two of them on the right hand side. You can kind of see with their pink foot kicking off from the water um, and amidst a flock of hundreds of sooty shear waters. And this is a West Coast restrictive species. So that was very neat to get to see um, a Pacific only species. Um, and uh, so that, that was a real treat. They nest, I believe in kind of islands off the coast of Mexico. Um, so they, they are more of a um, uh, South Pacific breeder. Um, but yeah, so that was that was really awesome to get to see a lot of these. Um, and then a species that might not be as exciting for a lot of British birders, but was exciting for me because I had yet to go to northeastern um, North America and get hundreds of these guys, but common MERS were everywhere. They were easily the most common alcid on the open ocean in the Pacific. Um, lots of lots of them around. Um, it was quite interesting to see the uh, range of plumage variation in these guys. Um, so we, we went in, I believe it would have been um, August and these guys had just bred. So there were some um, uh, younger birds and some adult birds, but this bird I believe was just molting um, and they would 
flock. They would come in hundreds and hundreds, waves of hundreds on the on the ocean. And then um, if a bird or if there was a fish um, school nearby, they would all either get up at the same time and move based on where the school moved. And um, one of these guys just decided to pop up right next to the boat, providing insane looks. So that was that was very exciting just to get to see um, these guys. And they, they nest in islands right off um, where we were, maybe not even 20 miles away from where we were. So um, relatively close um, nesting islands, just kind of rocky islands off the coast of California where they are, um, along with guillemots and uh, pigeon guillemots and other houses. Our next pelagic species, which was very exciting, was the northern fulmar. Um, this was a species I had not seen ever, so getting to see one of these guys at close range was quite exciting. Um, this is a gray morph or a kind of dark morph um, of the two morphs that you can see of these guys, um, and they were quite interesting. They, they acted more, again, like kind of Jaeger types, they would, which is interesting. They would chase the city shearwaters off um, for fish, and they would they would chase them all the way. I mean, they. I remember one individual. I think it was this individual that I photographed uh, before setting down. Um, there were two uh, city shearwaters just in the water next to it, and one of the city shearwaters had a fish. And as soon as the fulmar saw saw that that shearwater had a fish, it immediately targeted on it and. Um, all of a sudden, uh, another fulmar showed up, and uh, they got the uh, the gray. This guy got got the fish and was eating it, and then finished it, and just sat there very happily for a couple seconds right off the boat. Um, so we got really great looks at it. Um, this white individual came uh, alongside the gray individual, so that was really neat to get to see. I um, mean, we were actually at the southern edge of their kind of Pacific range. Because um, they breed in the high Arctic um, in areas right off the North Atlantic and North Pacific. So um, in, I also uh, asked one of the captains, so Debbie, she said that in the Pacific, um, the gray individuals, I believe, are 80% more uh, common than the white individuals, which I found very interesting, um, just purely based on uh, morphs of these species. Um, in terms of occurrence, I found that very interesting, that fact. Um, but then the next species that I was so excited to see was a tufted puffin. So I was actually the first person on the boat to get to see this guy. Um, so I was scanning a flock of MERS right off the, the boat, and all of a sudden, this beautiful tufted puffin popped up um, with the plumes and everything. Um, and it was just, it was just gorgeous. Um, it was a bit far from the boats. So this is kind of a heavily cropped image, but they were just, they, they're such incredible birds. They, they nest um, about mm, 20 to 25 miles away from where we were. So that individual more than likely had just bred um, or was just wandering. Um, they breed in very local numbers in California, um, all the way up, up to um, Alaska, where they are pretty regionally common up there. Um, but it, we were on the southern edge of the species, so it was it was very nice to get to see um, get to see that. But um, but yeah, so that that was really neat. Um, and then. Jaegers, so or skuas, I guess I should say. Um, the next species was a Pomeran Jaeger, um, and this was the largest of the three uh, skua or Jaeger species. And since we call South Polar and uh, Great Skua skuas, it's I'm saying Jaeger, but yes. Um, this was a photo I got of one individual that flew in um, when there was a big influx of. Uh, pink-footed shearwaters and sooty shearwaters right up the boat, um, and all that commotion kind of attracted these guys. Um, but I had never seen um, a pomeran, um, so this was quite uh, awesome to get to see. Um, they they are such beautiful birds. Um, 
largest of all three. Um, and you can kind of get that sense by looking at just the wing. Um, they have that white kind of underneath the uh, main primaries on the underwing, which is a, a big um, characteristic uh, of them and only them. They have thicker bills and um, the two individuals we saw kind of had that um, almost paddle-like shaped tail, which was which was awesome just to get to see finally. Um, and this was another species that had um, had been seen in um, Indiana at the lake that I had just missed over and over again. So this was a nice, nice to finally get it. So this, this was quite exciting for me. So our next species um, was Bowler's Shearwater. So this was a heavily cropped image of one of five birds that uh, flew out pretty far from our boat. So very shy birds, um, but are very common in the Pacific, um, but just kind of local. Um, our captain said that they are not an every trip kind of bird. Um, it just really depends. So we were very lucky to get to see uh, some individuals, but they're, they're very interesting in that their plumage resembles more of species that are um, kind of found in the South Pacific and almost um, Indian Ocean. So prions and others. So they have this very kind of silvered and black pattern on the back. And you can kind of get that sense from looking at this photo. Um, so it was, it was very neat to see such a stark different shearwater um, out there. Um, and of course, these guys were not as social as the pink footed in cities and they were very quick to fly away um, and they did not stick around the slick very long. So that was a real treat to get to see these guys. Next um, was the rhinoceros aquat. So these guys are quite interesting. Um, I had really, really, really hoped that we would get a chance to see them because um, they had been reported on the trip all throughout the week. Um, or the week, the previous weeks that when they had gone out. So I was really hoping to get it and it was kind of nearing almost the end and we, we hadn't seen one yet. And then um, I just kept scanning those myrrh flocks and all of a sudden one popped out and uh, it was pretty close. Um, so that was really, really neat. They got these kind of evil looking eyes, um, these kind of white um, facial patterns, um, but they're, they're a large auklet for the auklet species. Um, and so that, that was a real treat to get to see this alcid. Um, and you can see they breed in, um, as far as the North Illusion chain, all the way up through Alaska and Northern Canada. And then just are, they're not a big open ocean species. Um, so they're just kind of strictly to the coast um, in migration of, of California, all the way down to the Baja Peninsula of Mexico. So this was this is a really neat species to get to see, and I was I was very happy to get to see this guy. So then came the kind of the star of the show, really, uh, for this day, um, the seventh pelagic species of the day, black-footed albatross. So these guys were incredible. So after getting to Bowler's shearwater um, and auklet and uh, the puffin, the excitement was still high, but there was a, a, a pretty lengthy lull in new birds. And I was scanning just kind of along the horizon, um, just really trying to find anything new. And my friend Nick caught the eye of the, these two large birds coming in um, just really from really far out um, off, off the ocean. And, he told Debbie about it and Debbie immediately identified those two large birds as uh, black-footed albatrosses. And so these two black-footed albatrosses came right into view, um, eating, uh, immediately setting down in the slick and eating stuff. Um, their flight is just so flawless and agile. Um, and it, you would ex uh, expect that being that they are an albatross species but they are actually the smallest albatross species in North America. Um, and they, they were large birds. So it was pretty interesting to, to find that out. Um, but they, they were 
fairly large albatrosses. Um, and this is my first albatross species I've ever seen. Um, so it was just incredible to get to see these guys. This is another one of my photos of, of them. And you can just see based on the worn um, uh, of their wings that, you know, this is a species that might have bred, you know, as far north as somewhere near, you know, Russia or kind of um, in, in North Pacific and it, it, they migrate all the way as south as almost um, Southern California, which is just fascinating to think about that this, this individual came from so, so far and um, they just drift in the open ocean just searching for, for food. Um, and they, they heavily rely on their sense of smell like many tube noses do, um, but just their sheer size is just, it was just breathtaking to get to see. Um, so that, that was really quite, quite amazing to get to see this bird. So our eighth pelagic species of the day was our first uh, storm petrel of the day, ashy storm petrel. And this is kind of not, almost the most common storm petrel in the Pacific, um, especially in the area that we were. Um, these birds were probably the most frustrating to photograph in the entire boat trip. They, they would fly in, um, so the, this bird in particular flew in with another individual, so two birds, um, and it circled the boat once and they were kind of far out and then it disappeared. And then 15 minutes later came back, did the same thing, disappeared. And they did it three times. And on the third time, I finally got a photo because one of them came close enough to get just one picture um, in focus. And that, that was a very difficult feat, but I, I got it. So you can kind of tell the difference between this and the three others that were potential in the area by its whitish gray rump. You kind of see on the top end of the storm petrel. Um, and it's, you can't see it in this photo, but on the upper wing, they kind of have a faint but tan stripe um, that kind of separates them from black and least storm petrels that are also in the area. Um, and, um, but they were also kind of larger. So unlike, um, they're similar to leeches in, in the Atlantic, um, they have this longer tail and longer wing profile that made them pretty distinct. Um, uh, birds to, to pick out um, when flying, despite how fast they, they flew. Um, so amazing species. Um, I was quite happy with how um, that went, but we started turning the boat around and we were really kind of like satisfied with all the birds we had seen, um, but two extremely unexpected birds. Um, showed up on our way back. So the first extremely unexpected bird happened right after the storm petrels and the albatrosses. Um, and I had literally just got done taking the albatross photo when I took this photo of a flesh-footed shearwater. So flesh-footed shearwaters are uh, extremely interesting species. They nest in um, North New Zealand, um, in islands surrounding there, Oceania Island, um, and or the chain of islands there, um, quite incredible. So this was am amidst a flock of so uh, sooty shearwaters, and you can see that they they are around the same size, slightly larger, um, but they have this bright pink bill and all dark um, over, and this seems to be a very interestingly. Um, or a uh, very advantageous plumage type because if you think about, um, I'm trying to think of the albatross species, short-tailed albatross, uh, juveniles can have this exact plumage. They are chocolate brown with the pink bills. Um, so it seems to be a very uh, advantageous um, fit for a lot of these pelagic species to have. But this was an incredibly rare bird. Um, I believe it was the second or I mean the third individual of the year that they had had or second individual of the year that she had seen. 
So it was quite incredible. Um, like I said, they nest all the way from North New Zealand and they migrate all the way to central Southern California, which is just unbelievable to think about the distance um, that this bird traveled um, to get to this point. Here's another photo showing this bird next to a city. You kind of get the sense, and the city was a little closer, so it's kind of not the best perspective because um, it makes it look like the city was a little bigger, but they have these gorgeous chocolate brown color um, kind of contrasting to the sooty that's kind of a duller brown. Um, and they have this just beautiful bright pink bill um, that just stuck out like a sore thumb. And this bird just stuck around for long enough to get, you know, a few photos of it. And then um, it just cycled out, disappeared. Um, and that, that, was, that was it for that. So that was highly unexpected, easily the best bird of our boat trip. Um, so that, that was incredible. Um, but after this, um, a very random species showed up that I was never expecting. And I only recently discovered by looking through my photos. So least storm petrel. So this is a very, not, not the greatest picture, document picture. So here's the story on this bird. This, I saw this storm petrel right after the flesh footed had flown by and everybody was very distracted with that bird as they should be because it was a flesh footed shearwater. And I took a photo of a smaller storm petrel that flew by very quickly. But I think in that moment, I must have just completely forgot that I take, had taken the photo or saw this bird at all because I had never made a note in my eBird checklist that I'd seen this bird. So I'm going through my photos um, for this presentation. And I remember that, that kind of mystery bird that I had meant years ago to just uh, look at and uh, kind of pick apart and identify. And I finally realized that this was the least storm petrel that um, it would have been an incredible addition to the pelagic. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people probably would have wanted to see, but I, what I recall from this sighting was right after the flesh footed had just about disappeared, this bird flew in my peripheral view long enough for me to seriously get, snap one photo and then it was gone, disappeared. I remember looking for it and then making a mental note telling Nick, I just saw a storm petrel fly by. He, he looked, could not find it. Um, and I, I, that, that was that. So it was a very quick and very lucky sighting, but this was a pretty rare bird for our trip. They're typically a Southern Pacific species. Um, they're the smallest storm petrel in North America. Um, they are um, very small uh, Pacific storm petrel, um, and they got shorter tails than the longer tailed black and um, ashy storm petrels that are, can be seen. And you kind of see those stubbier wings, just very um, dainty in size. And the, the white or the uh, brown kind of streaking on the upper wing is almost absent. You can kind of see that in the upper wing in this photo. So that was an incredible um, bird to see, um, considering they nest off the coast of Mexico and migrate to Southern California, but um, we were in Central California, so it was even more um, shocking to get to see this. So that was incredible, and it was a heck of an ending to what 100% was one of the best, most amazing birding days I've ever had um, in my life. So. Um, the trip summary, I got 16 lifers during the pelagic trip, um, four of them not included in this presentation. So it's difficult. My pictures weren't the best. I decided to include this. This was a very, very distant Scripps murelet that we had seen um, on the pelagic somewhere around um, the middle of the trip. And that was extremely exciting, um, but my photos weren't great. So I decided, I, probably wasn't going to go into it too much detail, but I thought it would be make a good trip summary photo. So that is a, a Scripps murelet. So that was very nice. Um, we had also seen marble murelets um, right actually, right as we got on the boat. Um, and after we saw sooties, there were distant marbles flying over, which was over the ocean, which was crazy. 
um, Pigeon Guillemot, and Cassin's Auklet. Um, Cassin's was shortly after this bird. Um, they were flying distantly um, and then landed very, very briefly in the water and then flew off again, um, scared by another flock of sooty shear waters out there. And um, so that was incredible. They could see all these birds. Um, and I had a few more days to bird California after this on land. And I actually ended up with a total of 40 lifers for this uh, entire California trip. So that was 100% the most successful birding trip I've ever done. Um, and I truly can't imagine, um, you know, having not done this. The only unfortunate thing about all this is I was a incoming freshman to Purdue University and my freshman orientation was um, scheduled for the Monday that we had another pelagic trip scheduled. Um, and my mom being a reasonably good parent who was paying for my education said, you need to come back for freshman orientation and you can't go on the second pelagic trip. So even though I didn't get to go on the second pelagic trip where they got South Polar Skewa and um, Forktail Storm Petrel and other very amazing species, I was happy to have gotten the species that I did. So I can't complain too much. Um, I've forgiven my mom for sending me back, but um, but yeah, so this was my trip and I, I really hope you guys um, enjoyed my talk. So if you guys have any questions for me, um, 